Hi, I'm Joanna Valsamis, Director of Knowledge Mobilization at Canada's Stem Cell Network and your host of Stem Cells from the Sofa. In this unique series, I sit down with some of the brightest minds in the field. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bernard Tabo, neonatologist at the Ottawa Hospital in CHEO, senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and CHEO Institute, and professor at the University of Ottawa. His work focuses on bronchopulmonary dysplasia, a chronic lung disease in preterm infants. Dr. Tabo is also the Associate Scientific Director of the Stem Cell Network and serves on our board of directors. Thank you for joining us today, Bernard. Can you tell us a little bit about bronchopulmonary dysplasia and your clinical trial? Yeah, so bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a lung disease in preterm infants. So these are babies that are born too early, uh, up to uh, 12 or 14 weeks uh, too early. And their main problem at birth is uh, that the lungs is not fully developed and they have trouble breathing. And to uh, keep them alive, we uh, intubate them, give them additional oxygen and uh, mechanical artificial ventilation. And while this keeps them alive, at the same time, it damages their, their lungs. And so this eventually can lead to uh, a chronic lung disease that we call bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD. And it's the most common complication of uh, preterm birth. And it's also associated uh, with um, uh, brain injury and uh, can be associated with blindness. This disease has been described over 50 years ago and it, it is still a problem because we don't have uh, a good treatment for BPD. And um, our clinical trial is taking advantage of uh, regenerative medicine and uh, a particular cell therapy uh, that we have developed in the lab. And uh, now uh, we have been able to make the translation from the bench to the bedside. And uh, we are completing a phase one uh, trial. Excellent, thank you, that's really exciting. For viewers at home that aren't really familiar with clinical trials, could you tell us how they work exactly and um, how someone can get involved if they're interested in getting involved? Yeah, absolutely. So clinical trials are uh, critical uh, to make sure that a new therapy is safe uh, and uh, effective. And um, it's uh, very important to go through those um, careful uh, lead design clinical trials and um, there are different phases uh, of clinical trials and so a phase one trial will enroll only very few um, people 10 patients for example uh, and again is only there for to prove feasibility or um, uh, end safety uh, then uh, if um, this phase one trial is successful uh, you move to a phase two trial where you have hundreds of patients in which you test again the safety, but also uh, the efficacy of the therapy. And so you have a control group uh, and a treatment group, and then you can compare if uh, the therapy makes a difference. And then the phase three trial is the large trial with um, uh, more than hundreds of, uh, several hundreds of patients. Um, where you want to definitely prove that indeed there is uh, efficacy of this uh, medication. And again, there is only uh, this methodology, this rigorous methodology that allows you ultimately uh, to say whether a treatment is safe and effective in patients. And so um, to get involved uh, in our trial, the babies are all um, hospitalized in the neonatal intensive care unit. So they are uh, available in, in the unit to us. And if uh, they are eligible, we ask parents for consent uh, if they want to participate in the trial. Um, if um, uh, patients are not hospitalized uh, at home, um, but they are interested in participating in clinical trials, then usually they go through their GP, who can then guide them uh, to the appropriate um, physician or center who's doing um, uh, a clinical trial. And it's important that these clinical trials are um, registered at uh, clinicaltrials.gov, for example, uh, well-designed and, and performed in, in academic centers. 
Excellent, thank you for that. We often hear that the timeline for a drug to go from the bench to the bedside is really long. Could you give us a, an idea of the timeline for that journey? Yeah, it's way too long. It's uh, <laughs> 10 to 20 years and uh, it costs $1 billion. And um, you don't think about that when you start, obviously. <laughs> but um, uh, it takes so long because you have to do uh, the rigorous research uh, in the lab, uh, the discovery in a petri dish, uh, test exploratory studies uh, in in vitro cell systems or uh, in laboratory animals, uh, and then uh, ideally go to explore uh, to confirmatory studies in large animal models that are closer to the clinical setting, and. Um, these studies are really important because they form the rationale for then embarking into clinical trials that are very expensive and, and, and time consuming. Um, and uh, for these breakthrough therapies that regenerative medicine is, is bringing to light, um, you need uh, Health Canada approval. And um, then um, uh, performing a clinical trial, a phase one takes six months to one year just to be done. Uh, but the preparation time is also long. And then a phase two trial typically takes uh, two years to be completed, um, plus probably a year to, to prepare such a trial. And um, this explains why the time is, is um, why it takes so long. Uh, the other worry is that uh, it, it, uh, the translation often fails. So not all the therapies that appear promising in the lab uh, turn out to be successful therapies that can then be uh, given to patients and so uh, this is why um, there are now uh, ways of mitigating the risk of um, uh, failing the clinical translation and uh, we have applied this uh, um, in order to go to our phase one trial and um, I think it's a it's a new way of making sure that uh, we bring novel therapies faster and with a higher likelihood of success into the clinic. That's amazing. Um, so you talked about phase one, phase two, and phase three. Could you maybe expand a little bit on what happens between phase three when a phase three clinical trial ends and then how we actually get that therapy to the patient? Yeah, um, so after a phase three uh, trial, um, uh, you present the, the data uh, in front of the regulatory agencies, Health Canada in Canada, FDA in the US, and based on these uh, results, um, a uh, medication can get, then get approved for the indication it was uh, tested for. And um, that's, um, yeah, if you take only the clinical trials phase, um, this in itself can take six years, seven years. Okay, thank you. Um, so what are the next steps for your research and what are your hopes for the future? The next step is to prepare the phase two trial, uh, which we're already doing. Um, and we have to apply for funding. A lot of time is spent also to write grants and get the funding to get the trials done. And the phase two trial is, is very expensive. Um, and so um, this would be a trial uh, where we will have then a placebo group and the treatment group uh, to show that in addition to uh, safety, uh, this uh, cell therapy may also be effective in improving the respiratory outcome of preterm babies. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at um, uh, three years from now to know if this phase two trial um, uh, is a success. Um, and, um, but uh, there's overall excitement in our neonatal community because uh, there seems to be finally something uh, that could um, uh, make a difference for these babies. And uh, this could be a, a breakthrough in the making. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Bernard. The work that you and your team are doing are absolutely incredible. And as you mentioned, you're already impacting patient lives. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Stem Cells from the Sofa. Take a look at other conversations about access and affordability and the creation of therapies. <laughs>